Hey, so a lot of you asked about more advanced harmony writing techniques. So I'm gonna show you one in this video and also kick off a new series about composition and songwriting while we're at it. Let's get down to it. This video exists because of the generous support of patrons of this channel. If you'd like to see more videos like this, consider donating via the link in the description. Thanks. I'm gonna show you a technique that allows for independence of the harmony part, creating complex and deeply satisfying relationships between the harmony part and the lead. In learning this technique, we'll uncover the mechanics of how melodic lines work together, and we'll come to a realm of composition that classical masters like Mozart and Beethoven would have also studied. Counterpoint. It's a technique of composition that's been around since the 1500s, but with a few updates and refinements, it works really well for writing great harmony parts, even today. So, the most basic way in which two melodies can relate is in the direction of motion. Melodies can move in the same direction, called similar motion. They can move in the same direction by the same amount, called parallel motion. opposite directions, contrary motion. Or one can remain static while the other moves, called oblique motion. Let's pretend this is our lead melody for the moment. So a part that's full of similar and parallel motion will seem just like an extension of the lead line, maybe thickening or sweetening it, but not adding much in the way of complexity. Even though we've added a whole additional melody, it still feels like the same basic idea. But if you want to create a sophisticated harmony part, one that adds profundity and depth, then you'll need it to have a strong sense of independence. In which case, you want it to primarily move in contrary or oblique motion. This gives the listener the distinct impression they're hearing two concurrent, independent melodies so it feels more ornate, profound, interesting. So, if you want to increase the apparent gravity or complexity of your harmony part, strive to have it move mainly in contrary or oblique motion, and use similar and parallel motion sparingly. Now, striving for contrary or oblique motion is a simple enough directive, but in application, that's not enough to ensure a satisfying harmony line. There's still plenty that can go wrong, To avoid, accidentally, producing something like that, we need to pay attention to the intervals formed between the lead and the harmony part. An interval, by the way, is the distance between musical notes. We can think of that melodically over horizontal distance. Or harmonically, the vertical distance between notes sounding simultaneously. At the moment, we'll concern ourselves with these types of intervals, formed by the harmony and lead notes sounding at the same time. And not counting compound intervals, there are 13 of them, which might sound a little unwieldy, but we can simplify how they work, at least in terms of counterpoint, down to three basic categories. There are the dissonances. These are the biting, acerbic intervals, the seconds, minor and major, the tritone, called a diminished fifth or an augmented fourth, depending on context, and the sevenths, minor and major. Then we have the perfect consonances. These are the pure, hollow, open-sounding intervals. We have the unison, the perfect fourth, the perfect fifth, and the perfect octave. And finally, we have the imperfect consonances. We feel these alternately as somber and dark, like the minor third and the minor sixth, and bright and happy, like the major third and the major sixth. So before we go any further, you can see we need to be able to determine interval type between the lead melody and the proposed harmony note. If you're not sure how to do this, check out my video on how to determine intervals. See the link in the description. Okay, so a very simple reduction of how to manage intervals in counterpoint 
is to mainly drive by imperfect consonances, thirds and sixths. But we can't use too many of these in a row. No more than three is a pretty good guideline. Or we start to lose the sensation of independence and return to the dimensionless feeling of similar harmony. So to break up the procession of imperfect consonances, we introduce perfect consonances and dissonances in between. Now, we'll want to be careful with these types of intervals. For example, we usually can't chain more than one perfect consonance in a row without getting a hollow patch in the harmony part that feels out of step with the rest. Hear that sudden emptiness in the middle? That's the result of several perfect consonances in a row. And similarly, we don't often want to chain more than one dissonance in a row, else it starts to sound like we just hit a couple wrong notes. See what I mean? Now, don't get me wrong. Sometimes the harmony part opening up, feeling suddenly pure and set off, or descending into a tense, tangled, dissonant passage, is exactly what we need. So I'd really like you to think about this less like a set of rules, and more like a bit of insight into what creates beautiful, satisfying relationships between lines, and vice versa. What creates feelings of hollowness, unrest, discordance? The composer's job isn't just to create nice, pleasing sounds all the time. And as you create your own harmony parts, you'll uncover distinct emotions evoked by specific movements. These are your discoveries. They'll become a part of your voice. Don't just dismiss them out of hand if they don't sound nice. Okay, that being said, to get the idea down and the feel for it, let's harmonize this melody following our guidelines so far like a set of rules. In traditional counterpoint, it's customary to start on a perfect consonance. That's not really necessary in modern styles, but let's go with it for now. Our lead line's a C. Let's start our counter line on the C the octave above. The lead line's stepping up to D. Let's create some contrary motion by stepping down to B. Together. So far, so good. Our lead line's moving up to F. We can allow some tension to be created by remaining on the B in the counter line, giving us a tritone between the two voices. As a note, you'll want to be mindful of leaping into dissonances. In this case, the lead line's only moving by a minor third, not very far, and the other voice is staying static, sort of smoothing out the motion a bit. But with wider leaps, and particularly with both voices leaping at the same time into a dissonance, you get something that feels unsettling. It's worth filing that away in your brain somewhere. Okay, the lead line steps down to E. We can resolve this tritone really delightfully by moving the counter line up in the opposite direction to C. Together, we get... Very sweet. Now, I do want to say, what we're doing is an abstraction, a moment of melody against melody floating in free space. But you can see how a situation like the one we just managed can be a really pivotal moment in a composition. You could choose to extend the dissonance, develop it, recontextualize it, veer the resolution off in an unexpected direction instead of straight to the satisfying location or any number of other options. The point is that what you choose depends on the context of where this is occurring in your piece and the effect you're trying to create. And at the selection of every note, you're shaping the conceptual and emotional plot of your music. I want to stress this. Counterpoint or any other compositional device should never become a mechanical process that supplants your creative or intellectual expression. They're merely tools and you use them in pursuit of creating your vision. Okay, you get the picture. Back to counterpoint. Our lead line bumps up to G. Now we've done pretty well with contrary and oblique motion up to this moment, so let's see if we can create some variation. 
we can move to a perfect consonant by similar motion if we step up to the D in our counterline. That gives us Great. Our lead line steps down from the G to F. We can drift into an imperfect consonant by remaining on the same note in our counterline. Oblique motion into a sixth. Okay. And in what we call goal-oriented writing, it can be advisable to end on a perfect consonant and to approach that perfect consonant by contrary motion of a step. This achieves a feeling of completion by the end and gives us the sense that the destination at which we arrived was the one we were driving at the whole time, hence goal-oriented. This can be a deeply satisfying way to conclude a phrase. It also effectively fills in the last two notes if this is the effect we want. So, to end on a perfect consonant at the end, let's get our counterline landing on a C, an octave from the lead. Since we're trying to approach this moment via contrary motion by step, we'll notice our lead lines moving down by a step, and so we'll need to move up by a step. Our last note's C, so our second to last note needs to be a B. The whole part sounds like this. Slightly more musically. And notice what we achieved. Just two melodies can create feelings of tension that release. An illusion of complexity and density and a sense of direction that leads to a satisfying conclusion. Now, there's a fair bit more to say about counterpoint. And depending on the specific era or style of counterpoint you'd like to create, there are some other considerations and constraints you might care to observe. But if you're primarily interested in creating effective and modern sounding harmony lines, you're off to a great start. Okay, any questions? Ask me in the comments. Subscribe so you catch my future videos. And as always, thanks for watching. I'm Sahar Gault. I'll see you next time.